does literature rethink? This is scandal, you know, it is uh, like a rhetorical question. Of course, does literature rethink, but we will see how and in which way and so on and so on. And then, and then when I read, read it, all, all of what we are doing then, and uh, uh, I need now your additional comments, um, um, uh, I insisted, uh, uh, because my professional deformation, that uh, literature can, cannot think without or outside the mandatory or philosophical uh, discourse or uh, philosophical conceptual network. And of course, this is, this is not my discover. You know, stupid or, you know, clever, it doesn't matter. You know, when Attridge prepare, prepare uh, uh, they, they read a book, uh, celebrate book, the act of literature, he in fact uh, uh, insisting that uh, in a huge uh, uh, preface, I don't know, 100 pages, to the reader, the reader text, that the, the, um, uh, the reader main obsession all of his life is not philosophy, it was literature. And even he insists, uh, uh, um, uh, I'm I, I just quoting something, to quoting for you, because it is very interesting uh, for us who think that Derrida is philosopher. No, Derrida is a literary guy, you know. And then we somewhere, yeah, yeah, the construction in America, this is the topic of article. And Derrida saying, the construction is uh, coming to term with literature, not with philosophy, not with science, mathematics, no. The construction comes with the literature. So, uh, it, in some sense, the reader try, as I understand this project, the act of literature, to try to deconstruct literary discourse as well as philosophical discourse, insisting that in some moment, both discourses, Joyce and Freud, can come together. In some sense, uh, not to say that uh, fiction and non-fiction uh, type of writing are the same. Of course, they are not the same. But there is something, according to the reader, on the end, after the constructive strategy of reading Joyce and uh, Freud, it must be come to the end of so something same. And uh, I, may, may I remind you, when the reader visit Belgrade, we have TV session. And uh, he was very unsatisfied with my uh, primitive and provocative question on TV, uh, why the other uh, friends, our philosophical friends, in these debates uh, asking uh, philosophical question, I refuse, of course, to ask him philosophical question, I ask him po political question and, uh, let's say, body question. So I ask, I ask him about uh, a, a battle secret battle, not public, between the reader and Habermas. And of course, he, he escaped to answer and refused to answer, and he understand my question as a provocation. And uh, of course, today I feel shame because I ask this question, you know, because uh, I didn't know what, is, what happened later. And you know, later, he signed uh, Habermas' uh, text. So they come to each other again together. Even uh, Habermas prepared the text and the reader signed it. For me, it was scandal. But this is the history of philosopher, you know. And then, for me, this article they signed together is promotion to leading country in Europe, French and German, then to leading uh, state philosopher, like in Plato vision, one, the biggest German philosopher, Habermas, and the other, the biggest French philosopher, this is Derrida. So there is three volume books about this, uh, 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 this small uh, uh, article uh, 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 signed by Derrida and, um, uh, and uh, Habermas mm, uh, with a lot of celebrating article and a lot of critique. You know, Umberto Eco, Richard Rorty, million thinker, uh, insisting uh, uh, regarding this article. They come to each other and uh, they, on the end, they die as a friend. And so I'm, big, I'm back to the question. So, uh, so what is your, I know what you are saying in a couple of places in our debate about the relationship between narratives, 
uh, literature and philosophy concept. Uh, and uh, you're saying I don't uh, separate this, of course. So what is your <laughs> thinking now about uh, uh, stigmatization of literature through philosophical concept? <laughs> I, I, I reject it entirely. You know that. I mean, uh, um, first of all, uh, n there's nothing surprising to me about uh, the idea that Derrida is obsessed with literature because that's just a fact. And uh, in, in even my own autobiography, but even Derrida's own uh, biography as a thinker um, suggests that Derrida would not have become as famous as he became despite the fact that he's probably the greatest philosopher of the second half of the 20th century, if he was not discovered by literature departments in the United States, by literature departments. Because li literature departments and students of literature discovered him, he became what he became. Uh, and they discovered him because he spoke to them in a way that nobody else could speak to them and that explanation is, is also, uh, this can be further explained uh, by the fact that his concern is primarily with the writing. Remember, his, first, his very first argument, which was conducted a critique of Hegel, was that, um, and Heidegger too, um, was that uh, philosophical writing uh, hides the fact that it speaks in metaphorical terms. It pretends to speak straight and conceptually, but in fact, it actually deceives the reader uh, in that way because it is, after all, writing. Like every, everything in language is about writing. Or, or everything in, in literature in terms of the, the meaning of the word that it had back in the 19th century, which meant everything that's written is literature, right? Let Right? Um, so because Derrida was concerned with writing as the neglected um, part of, uh, of the expression of linguistic expression, right? The neglected part of linguistic expression, um, then it makes total sense that literature would be for him the, the, both the friend and the enemy as a, as a philosopher. So, there's, so that's, there's nothing here that's strange at, at all. Um, and and um, it, took, it, it explains why philosophers took a long time to understand and handle uh, Derridean thinking. Um, so, uh, so to come back to the very first thing you said, because um, I want to also hear Nenny's views about all these matters, uh, I, I think that, um, of course my argument is that literature does not need philosophy. Um, in fact, literature has suffered since the time of Plato, <laughs> who after all, uh, you know, uh, argued that philosophy must destroy poetry. Remember, that was his argument, because poetry was dangerous to the citizens of the city. Poetry was what uh, created uh, bad citizens, not responsible citizens, um, it confused them, it, 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 you know, and, and, and it intoxicated them. The word is intoxication, in fact. And, um, and that philosophy with this sort of clear uh, uh, relation to truth, uh, it has to win. And this battle that Plato inaugurated, he started with, uh, has been really a problem ever since. Because theology, which comes after that, follows philosophy and doesn't follow poetry, except in the writings of certain mystics, and so on and so forth. So um, I think that uh, literature, in the way that we'll go back to Tanya's very first point, um, that certain kind of writing uh, liberates language and thought from the conceptual sphere and from its uh, attachment and even desire for truth. In, the, in, a cl in truth as clarity, because there's a lot of truth in literature, but a very different order. So, um, so that's why this book, this is a very strange book for me. It's very interesting that we're discussing it now, because it's so long ago that I wrote it, but um, it's very close to my heart, because it is, it, is, it is, as I told you, it's my training. And yet, I feel very strange towards it, perhaps because it's so close, perhaps because I'm writing things that are about philosophy more than 
than, than ever. But um, in any case, th so yes, of course I continue to disagree. I think that literature is, is, is the antidote to, f to the hegemony of philosophy, uh, if we can say that. There are all kinds of other things. You, I remember our conversation, you're right to say it. There are parameters of literature. There's the market. There are uh, canons. Uh, there, are, there are frameworks that make literature behave a certain way, be understood a certain way. Oh, these are political issues. They're very important I don't, and historical issues. I don't mean to disregard them at all. But, uh, but beyond those, there is this other level which I'm trying to, I think, uh, discuss. Hey, well, this is a really brilliant comment.